Bonjour, Pitonote. Euh, encore moi et encore en anglais. Euh, cette présentation s'appelle euh, When Generating Code Makes Sense. Quand une bonne idée, euh, si une bonne idée de générer euh, du code. À propos de moi, j'habite depuis 20 ans en Allemagne. Je pratique euh, presque jamais le français. Alors, euh, je m'excuse. Je vais continuer. À euh, en, en anglais. I didn't start out trying to write a code generator. Really, I just wanted to do just one little thing. But I've got 200 classes to write. Okay, this is about working on the OpenPixel library. Uh, it's for reading and writing Excel files. Um, I didn't start it, but I've been maintaining it since 2013. And uh, read, write files, and do things like make charts for my customers and say, look, you've got the fastest website. And they go, hmm, make it pretty. Like, what do you mean? Well, you know, make our line dotted, make it stand out, make it sure that, well, okay, that's, gonna, that's fine, I'll do that. That can't be that hard, can it? So let's look at the source code. Okay, don't, don't read it, just sort of go, ugh. That's ex it's all excellent. This is not exactly the source code for making a line dotted. This is just to write an axis, and it doesn't even do that correctly. It's a nightmare, but it works sort of, as long as you're going to do just that. You know, um, it's really an example of what we might call schizophrenic transformation, because we have a reader that reads XML, and it turns it into Python in our own API. And when we want to serialize that, when we want to save the file, we write it out to the XML. And actually, the input and the output are essentially the same thing, but we have completely schizophrenic bits of code. It's a lot of code to maintain. It's not particularly easy to write. It's procedural code at its worst. There must be a better way. Well, then let's hope so. Actually, what we really want is something like this, a reversible representation. XML is just the serialization format of our Python objects, just to look at it in one way, just like a pickle is. You know, pickle is just a Python object written to, written to, that you can write to a file. We sort of really want to do something like that. You know, it should be possible. Um, and if we can do this, you know, reversibility is guaranteed. We'll have read-write capability at no cost. We'll get rid of a lot of code. So let's look at what you actually need to do to get a dotted line in an Excel chart. So you're seven levels in. Actually, you're also suddenly changing namespace, and you're on non-standard units. I mean, so let's look at this. You can do, sort of do this today with LXML Objectify. Okay, so you're seven levels in, and I mean, you can sort of guess what those some of those names might mean, but you know, does anybody know that that unit actually refers to 50 pix five pixels? It's a special unit that you're not going to come across anywhere else. Um, and if you're going to stick with this, you have to follow the specification absolutely. And it's worth noting, saying doing that, that. The data series, the SEER in that, in that uh, sequence there, is different for each different type of chart. So you're going to have to learn to deal with that in your own code. That's not an API. You know, that's a road to hell. Um, but it sort of says, OK, there's an API. If we can work out a way of dealing with this, then we might be able to get rid of all this procedural code. So OK, um, OO XML, Office Open XML. Microsoft was put under a lot of pressure by lots of people, including French, French authorities, to release a uh, specification for the file formats when they did Office 2007, because everybody's going, not another proprietary format. We don't like this lock-in. Lots of pressure to do it. They did it, but it's really a bit shit, to be honest. There are some good things about it. What's good? It's a public schema. It's been handed over in America to ANSI, uh, in Europe to ECMA. So, you know, you can read it. Um, and 
You don't have to worry about reverse engineering a format. And you can submit bug reports. Hey, I've got submitted several bug reports. Some of them have even been accepted, which may mean that future versions of the specification are slightly less shit. OK, it's good libraries. It's XML in a zip archive. So we have no problem, no language is a problem reading and writing this format. You know, it could be worse. It could be some binary thing, so you actually have to write a parser to do the binary stuff. There is a binary extension that's proprietary that Microsoft has got patents on. And unsurprisingly, nobody's using it. It's, we have known in input and output formats. It's XML. So we know exactly where we're going. And the specification, all the elements and Azure Reach do decompose nicely to things that we know how to work with. So we know how to serialize and to read and write the XML for these in Python. You know, it's an integer, right? So all you need to do is to write the representation of that. With floats, you have to do some uh, monkeying around to get a consistent representation of floats across Python versions, but it's all doable. And it's because it's composed. If you can do that, if it's composable, you can do this at the lower level, you can do it all the way up. So let's have a look at this, the schema just for the font type. Okay, it's okay, we, we, can, we, we can look at that and we go, I can sort of make sense. There's a bool there, there's an int there. We've got some constraints, but unfortunately, even to something like LXML, which has got a, a schema parser, all it sees is a load of nodes. So it doesn't see a cons any kind of typing, and it doesn't see any kind of constraints. So in order to do this, you're going to have to parse this and implement yourself. Um, but you know, uh, w we're sort of getting there. You know, we sort of know what we need to do. And that's the really bad thing about OOXML. It's incredibly verbose. We're talking about 5,000 pages of specification and schema documentation. It's not even complete, and it's inconsistent. We have distributed data. So all of a sudden, you'll be working on an object and find that the data you need to deal with is in another part of the archive and may actually be running under a different namespace. Great. You know, This is not something you want to expose. I don't think you want to expose this in a Python API because People are going to write hate mail to you. They're going to send you letter bombs. And worse, it's inconsistent. So naming conventions, you sort of, well, why is this called like this? And you see that different people are working on the specification, probably at high, under, under pressure at high speed at different times. So sometimes you have sort of things with just a single attribute. And you go, well, why don't you just sort of make that a higher level attribute or you know, just a, a, a child, a, a, a text object? Yeah, well, pff, I don't know. And constraints, you have some fairly arbitrary constraints in there. But, you know, it's there. I mean, we can do it. So we can take something like this. You know, this is, we can read this and go, OK, you know, why can't we do this in Python? You, well, you can't. I mean, you can, this is what we want. We want to be able to say, if somebody sets the char set on a font, it has to be an integer, so we want a type error or a value error. So we want some kind of exception at runtime when it happens. When you validate the XML, you can only validate the whole tree. So it'll tell you all the errors you've got, or it'll tell, actually it'll tell you you've just got some errors. You just don't comply with the specification. Do it again. Um, so unfortunately, Python does not do type checking. You know, it's a dynamic language. We have strong types, but it doesn't do type checking. It's not going to say, no, you can't have that because it's not a string. We want that. We have to do. If we want that, we have to do it the hard way, and we have to write some kind of procedural code somewhere that does something like this. Whether it's doing duct typing or anything, we're going to have something like this. So didn't I say I had something like 200 classes? And that's about 2,000 attributes. I haven't counted them. I've got probably stupider things to do in life, but you know, it's, it's one of the more stupid things. And it's not something I'm terribly keen at doing at the moment. OK, so I'm not insane, honestly. So we do have a solution for this in Python. We have descriptors. Does anybody know what descriptors are? Does anybody use descriptors? Oh, wow, so you're going to learn something. OK, uh, a descriptor intercepts a call to an object attribute. So this is really good for implementing a type system. 
It's declarative. It allows us to work declaratively. It's testable. And it's reusable. So I've got these, let's say, 2,000 attributes, and I need some type checking for all of them. I do not want to have the same bit of copy and paste code all over the place, because if that doesn't work properly, I've got lots of stuff to fix. An overview of a descriptor, it has, as well as the init, it has three me methods. Generally, you'll only work with a set method if you're going to look, if you're implementing a type system. In other situations, caching, uh, you might want to look at the get method. Um, and it also has a delete method. You most commonly come across a, um, descriptors when working with properties. Properties actually just implement the descriptor protocol for you. And then you're normally working with the get when you just say, well, it's actually a method, but I'm going to present, pretend it to, present it to the user as uh, um, a property, as an attribute. So, OK, this is you know, a very simple type-based descriptor. You know? It says, I'm going to check that whatever I get is a string, and otherwise I'll raise an error. You might want to do other things, but that's how it works. So I can write this once. All right. Um, the init gets bound to the class. A descriptor is initialized when the class is initialized. No, when the class is created, not when it's initialized, sorry. And the set works on the object instance. And it does, it just depends on um, an implementation detail of the way that class attributes work. They're actually kept in a dictionary. So we can is intercept set attra and get attra and del attra if necessary. Let's use it. So let's have a book class. It has an author and title, and they have to be strings. That will work. If I pass in, if I create an, uh, 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 an empty one, I'll get a type error because I've not allowed none as a type. You know, pass in some strings, it'll be accepted. OK, so I didn't invent this. You can't really Google this stuff. It's all in the Python cookbook third edition. This is available online, but I really recommend you buy this. David Beasley does a really good uh, the, the sections on some of the more sophisticated aspects of Python programming are really well explained, but it's all online. You can look it up. Um, but I, do, I don't know if it's available in French. I don't know how well these things are in French. I don't know if there's a French analog. I'm sorry. Uh, but I can recommend you can buy it. And this is the sort of stuff you can leaf through when, you, when you've got some time, just to sort of, I've, I've always thought it about, you know, Cython or whatever. It's pretty good. OK. So. We now have a way of going from this kind of schema to this kind of element. It works. Initially, I find myself re-implementing the styles part of OpenPixel, doing this by hand. But patterns soon emerge. You go, there's got to be a way, better way of doing this. You know, um, We've been using this for over a year. It works really well. It's real reliable. And actually, it's not a bottleneck, um, the, the, the stuff where we actually have performance problems. There wouldn't be much of a bottleneck if it was. But, um, so it's been tested, it's been road tested, and it actually, this is really a developer API. When you're working on a class, when you're extending the, the functionality of the library, you can just sort of use this. So I thought, oh, well, let's try de generating, because I'm doing the same thing. I was copying, pasting schema uh, into a text editor and just stripping it down and, and creating classes. And I said, well, actually, this is easily something the computer did better than me, or it should be. So, you know, you're passing the schema, you're creating a dependency graph, you have to get this stuff in order, and you create the classes, and you write the tests. So this is, you know, this is obvious and non-innovative. So, first thing is, don't use my code to do this. If you have something like this, use Spine. There's a library, Spine, it's actually about RPC, but it does all the schema stuff really well. I didn't know about it when I started this, and I'm doing something slightly differently. But if you have something like this, I really recommend using Spine. It may, at some point, I may look at merging the code I've done. I've done some things which is specific to our environment, but may have some more general things. And it, you can't do everything with it. Some, I found some uh, schema is recursive. And of course, you get some errors in Python when you have a recursive definition. And all this, by the way, is um, uh, really about generating source code that you're going to work on. Don't generate code at runtime. You're going to regret it, but you can do it if you want. Spine will let you do it, and the, you, there is no use case for it. So OK, uh, this is just a really horrible parser. Um, 
is spaghetti code. I mean, I'm writing it for myself. I have a couple of tests. It does what it needs to do. And please uh, forget you ever saw it. It does generate stuff that is usable directly 90% of the time, I'd say. And if some, the parser doesn't understand something directly, you're going, you won't either, so you'll have to look it up. This is the kind of stuff it produces. So at the top, there's the call to the library, and you pass in one of the types that you want to work on. Uh, this is designed to work atomically, just on one bit after the other. Um, it will do the dependency analysis, so if you do th some of the stuff, Deep down, with lots of child, lots of child objects, you'll get, you know, you might get 80 classes generated, and you'll just have to work through. So, but you know, you get generate some code, and if you're lucky, you know, there's nothing. This was generated. I tried this, and I don't think there's anything that needs doing t on this uh, before you go and use it. And actually, you know, I, I found I was doing I, all my tests looking the same. In a sense, there's not that much. To need four tests here, but um, I find that it's it's nice and reassuring to have tests, particularly when you start changing slight implementation details, as you always do when you go back to something after doing it initially. So this allows you, the test will allow you to develop the API without breaking too much code, because the test will tell you, sorry, what you thought didn't change things changed everything. Please fix it. Okay, so. The parser does the grunt work. It's great, uh, you know, it's got rid of a lot of code that I would have to have done by hand. Um, so what we now want to do is actually create an API because generated code really isn't an API. You know, all we'd be doing is we would be persisting this fairly awful Excel API. So we can look at flattening or concealing the hierarchy. We can uh, look through the docs to see what is the intention behind this element when it's described. Because sometimes you just look at the scheme and you say, yeah, but what's it trying to do? And we can compare with what Excel creates. Because, for example, when I was doing um, a stock chart, I found that if you want a stock chart, you actually have to have at least one item in the data, ser in the data series that, the item itself can have no value, but you won't, Excel won't create a stock chart unless it has something in this. And you can say, OK, I can put this in. So that what, what do we do? We want to simplify. We want to flatten or conceal the hierarchy. So we did have seven levels of hierarchy uh, just to change, you know, to make a line dotted. We want to clarify. We want to use more expressive names because LN or R or SPS are not very expressive. We can work through the docs to find names. We can work through our own code to see what works best. We can add convenience. So we can create factory functions. So we do this in OpenPixel to manage, I think there are 15 different data series or something like that. And we just present a single unified series to your client code. Did it work? Well, look for yourself, see for yourself. These are from the documentation, which I wrote to just to check that everything does what it's supposed to do. All the various chart types. OK, quick, quick review. So this is the, the, the code above. So you can see that we've really maintained the API. And this is important because it means that you really can twi twiddle all the bits if you want to. And it will also guarantee reversibility, so read-write capability. We've removed four layers of the hierarchy. We've made it more expressive. And actually, we can probably add something to handle these weird units in there. So I hope you, I find that more useful. It's not perfect. But I can't really elide much more without removing functionality. So in summary. Complete support for creating charts. Created about 200 classes. I haven't counted them. And it, actually, to do the stuff it took about two weeks in total. And a lot of this was tweaking the parser and working and, and descriptors, creating specific descriptors, particular types, uh, you know, particular regexes, particular formats, um, adding constraints, uh, improved generation, and standardizing a simpler API. 
And it's a great basis for extensions. I've started work converting more code to this, and we don't support everything at the moment, but we will get much, much be able to do much more, particularly in read-write situations, um, and we will be able to reduce our code base at the same time and increase test coverage. So, je suis fini. Vous avez des questions? Et je suis aussi ici demain. Merci. Pas de questions. Merveilleux. Hein? On a tout compris? Merci.